gonna give them a vision of the world. The way it really is. Welcome back to the seventh episode of Ken and John talking about Loudest Voice, Showtime's look at the life and times of Roger Ailes and the Fox News Channel. This is our, thank goodness, last ones of these. Uh, we saw the last episode last night. John, initial thoughts? Um, Ken, I, I, I never thought I'd say it. I felt dirty watching it. Um, it just it, it was just so distasteful and uh, so false and and made up and uh, i just i just didn't feel good watching it but i'm very glad it's over yeah look this is I, i've said it before this is if you are a liberal who hate fox news you actually might like to watch this show it it was it it did the perfect arc roger is the most horrific person ever everybody at fox is is, a, is an a-hole even down to the to the women who were the women who were supposedly abused were also kind of unlikable characters in this i'm not sure who was likable at the end of the end of the show but it was uh, it was pretty ugly and pretty gross and just very very wrong. So let's jump into the wrongness of it. So um, you know they the the producers of this show and I found out that the director of this show also was a producer on Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth. So you kind of know where he's coming in in politically. We've looked at the political contributions of uh, of of the producers on this show and oh shock. Not one of them gave to Republicans and they all gave to Democrats. All right. No surprise there. Um, the only person I think that they might have hated more than Roger Ailes is, is Donald Trump. So they open up with a lot of Trump. And, of course, Roger is is working on the Trump campaign. Now, he did go do some work with the Trump campaign very little after he got fired from Fox. But they made it look like he was he was uh, uh, producing the convention uh, during during all of this, which I don't believe for a heartbeat. Never saw it. It's never been publicly said by anyone. And I just don't believe it. John, did you see anything at all like that? Well, I, I don't. I, it also shows him kind of browbeating Paul Manafort, and I don't believe that was the uh, the relationship between the two of them. You know, just do what I tell you, Paul. Yeah, it was kind um, of interesting. He like really hated Paul Manafort in yeah, this, which I, which I, I remember talking sense. to to Roger about about Manafort before because they'd worked together for thirty years, or at least right. in in that in that world. And yeah, he was like Manafort's just an idiot. It was uh, that was kind of interesting. Well, again, I mean, this is. These are people who are never going to have access to somebody like Paul Manafort, let alone Roger Ailes. And so when you don't know what to do, you make it up. Yeah, no, it's very true. So um, it goes through the she she being Gretchen Carlson takes him out. He um, um, the the women come in and they testify against Roger. He gets thrown out of his office. All all relatively true things. Um, But then in one of the dumber scenes. Um, um, he gets the call. Roger uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch wants you at his at his apartment, and he's like all giddy, like, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get uh, I'm gonna get uh, to to turn this around." Rupert blinked, and I wasn't around during that period, but I've heard enough conversation. I mean, he was already negotiating his severance package. There was no like, "Oh, he'd been locked out of his office." They'd been trashing him. The the, the Murdoch kids especially had been trashing him in the press. This law firm that had been supposedly doing this uh, this you know fair analysis and investigation they were leaking things out to newspapers and it was it was clear where it was going so i thought that that was kind of a dumb scene there roger could always read a room and he could always read a situation pretty well and he knew he was finished at fox um the idea that he went over there like a little boy expecting a birthday party uh you know with his wife on his arm right uh just just defies any kind of realism Okay, so instead of spending too much time on this episode, um, we were going to go through the lowest seven points or the seven things that were just completely fabrication, uh, uh, the the seven liberal fantasy points of this show. Uh, the first one is is our uh, is is Roger and booze. Why don't you go ahead and uh, and, and talk about? Yeah, that I, I mean he's second. he's seen repeatedly, uh, you know, quaffing wine, and he had a, a scotch bottle in his office, and all that. None of that. I, I never saw any of that. In fact, I never saw Roger take a drink. Uh, I, I think in, in, in my 30 presence, thirty years, I had never seen him take a, a drink of right, alcohol. Right, right. I, I mean, mean, I've been I've, I've been to a couple of black tie dinners with him. I've been to dinners where a toast was mandatory. Right. He'd always lift his glass and and sort of just do a little motion with right. his hand and then put it back down. 
Uh, he told me once, he, he, he bought me an expensive bottle of wine for dinner once. I said, aren't you going to have some? He says, I've had enough booze for my whole life. And, <laughs> it was funny. And, you know, he didn't he drink just, coffee either. And I was like, why don't you drink coffee? He's like, I got enough energy with coffee. I turn into an axe murderer. So, yeah. like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, the second one, and, um, and it, was, it was something that I know everybody thought that this happened, was these flag pins after September 11th that Roger had a person, a staff member, get him and toss him in front of him. And he said, did even if you're having sex with a hooker, I want you to be wearing one of these lapel pins. He never told me to wear a lapel pin or anybody that I know on camera or anything like that. He was fine with them. What was your... Sure, sure. R- r- look, I mean, it was a symbol of patriotism. It was a symbol of national unity at the time. And it wasn't just people on the air that were wearing them. People in the newsroom were wearing them. And by the way, at other networks were wearing them. So, and at other, other workplaces. Uh, it was not mandatory. It was voluntary. Uh, as it turned out, a lot of our on-air talent uh, thought it was a good idea and decided to do it. I mentioned in a previous episode, I had to go out and buy my own. Uh, they sure weren't being tossed around like candy. And, uh, but I was proud to wear it. Uh, it's the American flag, and, it, and we were at war. And Roger had made a point to me that several of the other networks wouldn't allow their on-air people to wear that. And he was like, okay, so I'm pro-choice on pins and on the American yeah. flag. So. Right. right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a little squishy on killing babies, but I'm, right. I'm pro-choice on flag pins. Small thing. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll go from the, the, the minor to the, to the, to the larger. Um, um, Roger did have cameras and and cameras at his uh, at externally at his house in in uh, uh, upstate New York, and showing his hallway coming coming down here, this show made it look like he had everything wired that he had rooms and he was listening to people that he was watching his wife uh, do dishes at the house um, um, and, and and in fact in, in one of the episodes he was he was asking the the tech guy you can't put them in the bathrooms at Fox and they were like well no sir that would be illegal um, I thought that they took that to a silly level of of Hollywood in this. Yeah, look, there's there's a little bit of truth on both sides here, and that is Roger liked to know what was going on. He was not above surveilling other people. Um, uh, among other things, he was watching his house in upstate New York be constructed, and he was keeping his eye on the gardeners, and he was keeping his eye on the workmen, and uh, I saw that in his office, uh, you know, in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, however, uh, to for for him to he would have known what the negative blowback would have been if he had put cameras in the bathrooms at Fox. <laughs> or I mean, listening again, in the meetings a, and wiring yeah, rooms. Yeah, a, a, master of, a master of knowing what will happen if you do such and such. Right. And that's one of the things that made him, uh, I think, such a great leader. Right. Uh, uh, the next thing is Roger telling Trump years beforehand, you know, run for office, I'll take care of you. He did it through Roger Stone, who he didn't like Roger Stone. He never would have had lunch with Roger Stone, first of all. Uh, the concept of him pledging Fox's fealty to some political candidate, I, again, I think in the, in the general, certainly we were more pro, pro-Trump pro than, than, than pro-Hillary. But the concept of, yes, no matter what you do, I, I'm giving you Fo- I never saw any kind of indication that, that Roger had, had pledged the support of Fox or asked me as a senior person or you as a more senior person to, to help get somebody elected and just never no, saw it. No, Look, R- Roger, Roger loved two things uh, in, in order, the United States of America and Fox News. Uh, he believed that he was doing a service to the United States, and he was, after all, the creator of Fox News. He would never never have put Fox's prestige and position uh, out there as an unrequited gift to somebody, and, and least of all, to be honest, Ken, Donald Trump. Uh, he, he thought Trump was an entertainer. He thought he was pretty good on his feet. I think he liked Celebrity Apprentice. He had certainly had Trump on our air quite a lot to expostulate. But, um, but you know, as president, I, I think Roger was as shocked as, as many Democrats were to, to see you know, this this uh, aberration of a politician starting to take root. Expostulate. That's Talk. A, that's a new one for me. <laughs> okay, uh, this is one of my personal favorites. Uh, this is number five. There was no dark room on the 14th floor. Right. 
Um, let's, just, uh, let's just get over that, folks. You know, I mean, it just so, didn't happen. So look, this was this was something pushed out by the PR department because they were trying to say, oh, we're not the ones uh, um, um, doing anything negative against Gabe Sherman. And there were lots of people in the in the biz, in the building who, when when Gabe had taken a year of writing a book that everybody assumed was going to be a slam on on Roger and Fox, there there were people looking into him and saying, you know. He's getting money from organizations tied with George Soros, something that turned out to be true. He was, you know, there was a lot of there were a lot of questions asked on that. And and so Gabe Sherman in his book got it from one of his sources, and he only had one source here, and that source was making this shit up, that the 14th floor was this dark ops room and this and that. That was the most high-tech glass ceilinged and glass walled office that you'd ever seen and in loudest voice they take it to literally syria levels of of rubble and and the 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 good guy goes up and he accidentally gets on this floor and there's the red light and then people in the background are chattering because if you're going to do a special op yeah you'd want to go on the floor where there's no wall or no door between you and any schnuck that gets off the elevator just in case you were doing something like that but you know that's the kind of thing though that then sits in people's minds I mean, when you create a visual like that it's it's you know you assume it's true if you're watching showtime and it was ridiculous and stupid well i mean let's let's once again give credit where it's due roger knew that television was a very powerful medium uh, i guess the people that put this series together uh want to make sure that their televised version of events is the one that sticks in people's heads but uh you know memo to viewer there was no 14th floor dark room. Second thing very related to this, and this is the uh, the sixth one, is is them implying that Fox went anti-Semitic uh, mm-hmm. uh, against Gabe Sherman. Uh, so again, Gabe Sherman was the author of, of of the book about Fox, and that's what this is this is based on. He wrote a book called Loudest Voice, which, despite them saying was a bestseller, didn't really sell well at all because it was kind of boring. This show was not boring, I guess. Um, and well, neither neither is a snuff film. But. <laughs> it, well, this one opened up with Roger dead on the floor, so I, I, you, you make a point. Um, on this in, in this in this episode, or, or it was actually in the fifth episode, they implied that Fox worked with Breitbart News, um, and, and Breitbart did do a number of pieces against Gabe Sherman, and and Andrew was a friend of mine, and they did it happily, and they weren't a big fan of Gabe Sherman and, and some of his tactics either. But they, this show made the impression that, that they got a, a basically a 1940s era anti-Semitic drawing uh, with Gabe with the yarmulke and, and the oversized nose, something that you would have seen in, in, you know, in, in a lot of even worse places. And they made it look like Breitbart News, ironically founded and run by two Jewish friends of mine, uh, uh, did that. I thought, it was, uh, I thought it was a nasty, unnecessary, and just a, just a crappy thing for Showtime to do. And, and it bothered me the fact that there's some artist somewhere who drew this thing up, was told by Showtime producers to do this just to, to make Fox look anti-Semitic. And it was just bad. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, how, how, do you, how do you say this? Um, there are people in the world who don't like Jews on principle. Roger was not one of those. Uh, neither was Fox News, uh, where, you know, since we were li- working and living in New York City, a, a fairly decent percentage of our employees were of the Jewish faith. And and that was just, you know, okay, there were some blondes and there were some dark-haired people and I guess there were some redheads, but it wasn't an anti-Semitic atmosphere at all. Yeah, I never saw, I certainly never saw that. And then the last, uh, the last point, point number seven is no, Roger didn't rush to the set to try to in in, in the last times, and it's this ultimate scene of of, of the ulti, you know of the last episode. Uh, uh, Roger to clear his name, he bursts onto the set, sitting down, and and is barking out to the control room, and he just found an empty set and was going to demand that they put him on air and cut the feed and Bill Shine, and and then he had to kind of puppy dog get drawn out of there. Um, ridiculous, didn't happen. Another Hollywood. You guys really wish this happened, but it didn't moment. And, and, and here's what I would call close to definitive proof, Ken. If Roger Ailes had been on the set demanding to be put on the air, someone would have snapped a picture of that with their iPhone. <laughs> someone their, probably would have also turned the switch on to let him go. Well, yeah. Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, uh, for, for him to, to be, uh, you know, uh, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore on the air. Uh, that's just not who he was. And again, he was 
a television producer. He knew how that would have gone down, and he probably didn't want to put himself in that situation, no matter how angry he was. Right. Well, it would have been, uh, people would have talked about that for a few years. Yeah, as, just as they're talking about it now. <laughs> okay, John, final, uh, final, uh, final thoughts on, on this, uh, this series. Ken, I, I went back just to check and make sure I could pronounce it right. It reminded me of Lenny Riefenstahl, uh, the, the Hitler uh, adoring movie maker. Um, you only put in what you know people want to, what your bosses want you to put in. You don't put anything in that's negative. You don't put any contradiction. You don't put any subtlety or, or uh, any kind of tension in your character. Just make him a monster. Let's just make him a monster. And and I'm sorry, uh, monsters are, are, you know, kids like to watch monster movies. Uh, this was one that uh, kids shouldn't watch. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, look, Roger was a, was, you know, one of the, one of the most wonderful influences in my life. Um, um, you know, he wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect. Not sure about you. Um, um, but Working on the, it. But the, but the, the notions that came up both in the press of the atmosphere and all of those things were so wildly off base. Um, and, and whether X things did happen or not in there, and I think some of them did and some of them didn't. And, and so I don't want to act like, oh, there was never anything bad that, went, that happened within Fox News. It was a big place and there was a, big place, and there was a lot of bad things that, that, that certainly could happen and certainly did. But this show was uh, turned out to be kind of what I feared going in, that it was just going to be a, a person who hates Fox fantasy of what was going on inside of there and inside of his life. And uh, if you watched it and thought you got any semblance of reality, you, you really didn't. Doesn't mean you have to like him. Doesn't mean you have to like Fox News. But this was, uh, this was nothing. And then the irony of it was, uh, what, was the, what was the song? It was the John Lennon song is All I Want Is The Truth was the closing, the closing uh, song on all of that, on, on the entire series. And I thought, what a perfect way to wrap up such a screwed up, such a screwed up uh, show. Yeah. I mean, look, Ken, this, this was Disneyland for Democrats. It was La La Land for liberals. Oh, and man, uh, said that earlier. that's, you know, that, that's what it was. <laughs> and uh, it departed from reality real early on. Right. All right. Well, this was uh, this was kind of fun, and I'm glad yeah. we at least have this record. Uh, uh, we will answer people's comments if they're not being too much of a too much of a jerk down in the uh, down in the parts below. Please subscribe to our our channel. There's a there's a ding dong button down there that uh, I always like people pushing. Uh, we will have other videos that are, are coming up on less Fox and more news related subjects, and uh, you should find them interesting if you had any interest in watching this. All right. Thanks. Thank you, John. And bye bye. Till next time. If you like this at all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the little bell icon, and it'll let you know when the next one of these videos comes up. We're also involved in the comment section, so please ask questions or give your thoughts. We'd be happy to chat with you. Finally, La Court News is going to be putting out a lot more videos. We're taking a very critical look at the media because they often lie, and we would love to have you on board with this and giving us your thoughts as we grow this into something real. Thanks.